I am again walking along a platform at New London's Union Station, which is on the west bank of the Thames River. This building in New London is the sixth station building, opened originally in 1848, burned and rebuilt in the 1850s and 1860s, and finally opens as it basically is now in 1887. The arched doorway of H.H. Richardson's design is the only curved facet of the front of the building. And save for this, the only other circular element in the building is the original ticket booth at the back, trackside. Inside there are no internal columns, allowing for a large two-storey waiting room now restored to its original specification after the 2003 renovation. In the 19th century, many new and modified railway systems were created and some joined together, and they also changed names. So New London was designated a Union Station as it connected two railroads. The Central Vermont Railroad and the Shoreline both of which we will look at shortly. In 1914, this postcard shows the platform with a canopy to match the curve of the tracks and also had a raised eyebrow section over State Street. A pedestrian bridge for safety in passing to the ferry docks was constructed in 1912 and finally demolished in 1961. In 1996, the owners of Cross Sound Ferry proposed a footbridge from the parking garage to the ferry slips with Amtrak's financial support. But in 2001, after further consideration, Amtrak declined to fund the bridge. In 2022, the proposed building of the National Coast Guard Museum includes a footbridge across Water Street and the tracks again. The height of a station platform is set to enable passengers to enter and exit the coaches safely. And although there are ADA standards, it would appear that local situations sometimes take precedent. Here at New London, we have two train systems on the Northeast Corridor and also the Connecticut Rail, Shoreline East service. It is not surprising then that we have a range of platforms. Platform 1 is long and curved and is at a low level. Platform 2 is at a high level, though it also has a section at low level. A local road separates sections of platforms 1 and 2 so that the high-level platform on the southbound track is reached across a road and up a ramp or stairs. Amtrak built these high-level platforms for the new Acela Express service and added, of course, the catenary wires at 25 kilovolts over the tracks. On occasions, the train entry exit is achieved at ground level on the road. This is the case with coaches on track 6 that do not have any platform. This station is on a tight bend, which results in a fluctuating gap on platform 2 as the coaches pass. The tight track bends also give rise to significant wheel swing, as you can hear. In this 1890 map, we can see the tracks of the rails from New London across Winthrop Cove up the west side of the Thames River and those that pass southwards across Shaw Cove. The track to the Thames Bridge across Winthrop Cove had a trestle across the water that was removed in April 1916, being replaced by a new track having only a small bridge over the inlet. From the 1896 map, we can see the current NECR track leaves the mainline tracks 
near the Governor Winthrop Boulevard crossing and passes over the cove on a causeway. And with extra tracks from the piers under the mainline bridge. Let's follow it. The track heads off the main line towards the cove, then across the causeway and to land base track to under the bridge. This track, including the causeway, is still extant, though it appears unused. A second adjoining pair of tracks are connected to the piers and after the bridge go thence to the riverside. None of these lines appears to be well used at this time. As this series of railroad history has followed the at-grade crossings, I cannot fail to inform you that there is another rail crossing near 8th Street in the industrial area of the piers. It clearly does not have any flashing lights or safety barriers. In New London, there were large roundhouses and repair shops. The Sanborn maps show one in 1884 close to the causeway and another in 1891 on 4th Street. A more recent Central Vermont Railroad roundhouse in New London is seen here and later, though it was lost to a fire on the 31st of March in 2002. However, even though we do not have any current track usage, earlier photographs show the intense steam engine activity of the tracks in New London, including a statuesque coal tower. Freight houses were numerous in the development of the railroads, and there are a number of marked sites for old freight houses that were functional around the end of the 19th century. The adjacent structure to the east of Richardson Station may have been a baggage building, more recently a Greyhound bus office, though currently untitled and apparently unused. The NECR Vermont tracks pass under the P&W line and the Gold Star Road Bridge, past the site of the East New London Station that, in 1911, is shown diagrammatically on the riverside across the tracks at Eastern Avenue. It's now an industrial site. Close by in Riverside Park, along the riverside are three charging stations for electric vehicles. The empty wagons have been removed And from here, the two tracks merge into a single line over an at-grade crossing, passing through the grounds of the Coast Guard Academy. As the tracks wind along the west bank of the Thames, I will recognise eight flag stops, or depots. About two miles north of New London is Harrison, a flag stop station on this corner of Benham Avenue in Waterford. During the collegiate rowing competitions, this Harrison Landing was a good place to see the boat race. In addition to the P&W viewing trains on the east side of the river that I mentioned in part four of my story, viewers went in trains up the coast-hugging NLN line or sat in fixed enclosures, a big day out for thousands. A little further north were the next of the flag stops. Here at Richards Grove, a clearly defined crossing, and Scotch Cap, uh, though this latter was barely a formal crossing at all. Here in Quaker Hill, the railroad tracks cross Smith Cove from Richards Grove Road to Scotch Cap Road. In 1906, a trolley trestle supported a single car, whereas the current version supports the NECR freight trains. This is achieved on a substantive and attractive trestle. 
Bartlett's Point and Cove are four miles by steam train from New London and was the start or finishing line for the Yale and Harvard regatta. Bartlett's, I believe, was possibly the headquarters of the Cornell rowing team, who on occasions were part of the regatta program. The two or sometimes three tracks followed the coast and around the 49-acre Montville multi-fuel power generating plant. The track crosses Horton Cove on an existing trestle, seen here in 1957. Montville itself had a station at one time, or more accurately, at two times. The stop was established in 1849. It burned down in 1862. And a year later, a new station was built that appears in an 1883 map at milepost 6. That is confirmed by my current picture on the NECR line. These abandoned ramps nearby could at some time have been used for pedestrian or equipment access. Our final image is in the 1950s. The depot was torn down in the 1970s. The Kitty Morgue stop appears on the maps in 1881. It is remote and appears to be a resort. Its heyday passed in the late 1890s and the clubhouse burned down in 1915, again sparked by a passing train. A new larger structure was built in 1912, and I quote, it is of attractive appearance, painted two shades of brown, and has flaring roof on all sides. It was a busy station and attracted many visitors in the 1920s. Close by, another rural at-grade crossing can be found on Point Breeze Road, leading to good views of the river and Dow Chemicals on the other side. We also read that a large number of visitors came to this area for their summers. Camp Dewey was also set up here to train young men for the marine services in 1916 and 1917. From the map, you can see what is now the PNW line, which is clearly visible across the river. The Kitty Mog station is at the bottom of the map, with the Montville station at the top right, both on the central Vermont railway. Currently, the site has buildings that look suitable for a summer camp. Massapeake Station was located at the junction of Derry Hill Road and the rail line. There was a regular timetable stop in 1849. The 1883 map shows the position and style of the depot that could have had rentable space. Approaching Norwich up the coast, we arrive at Thamesville. This was a busy place around the large woolen mill buildings, now derelict. The old station buildings are also derelict and were clearly substantial. There were railway engineering facilities in the 1800s and staffing for them at the end of Shipping Street. From the area known as Mount Pleasant, the river is narrow and we can see the P&W Laurel Hill tracks on the east side of the river and the railroad tunnel over to the old Norwich station. Along the west side of the river, there are still current significant tracks for freight transportation, both north and south. To complete this part of the NECR line, we can bypass Norwich and Norwich Town and see the tracks that cross the Yantic River at Otterbando Avenue. I think this is the most complex set of traffic controls I have seen. And we end this section of our rail journey at the bridge that crosses the Yantic Falls.
and head off then northwest. We're back here in New London. We've come back down the west side of the Thames River, past the flag stops and the small stations, and come back from Norwich and Norwich Town and Yantic. So now we're back in New London, we're going down the other side and we're going to try and find our way through Waterford and the Limes. Just before we head off southwards, we need to specifically recognise the wide Atsgray crossing at Governor Winthrop Boulevard, providing vehicular traffic access to the ferries. All Amtrak trains cross here. The trains that do not cross here are from the Connecticut rail system that runs between here in New London and New Haven. We are fortunate that in June 2022, the Connecticut rail system has new engine and passenger units. In comparison, here is an example of the older noisy diesel engines and coaches compared to the new all-electric trains powered from the same overhead lines as the Amtrak Regional and Acela trains. The east boundary of New London is well defined. It is along the centre of the Thames River. The north boundary and west delineation define the area of Waterford that surrounds New London. It is along the west of the Thames that some describe the locations of stops as of Waterford stations. Southbound trains leaving New London and its Union Station experience our first at-grade crossing here at the station. Its closure is primarily to accommodate the passage of trains either stopping for passengers arriving and departing or passing straight through. It always has police attendance. Close by is the at-grade crossing at Bank Street Extension, with rail tracks that pass across Shaw's Cove on a swing bridge. This 130-foot Platt Truss Bridge, similar to this picture, was constructed in 1913, repaired in 1917, 24, 32 and 38, and finally replaced in 1984. The Coven Bridge are named after Nathaniel Shaw, a successful merchant from Fairfield, born in 1703 and died in 1778. The Shaw Granite Mansion that bears his name houses the County Historical Society. Leaving the Shaw Cove area, both Amtrak and Metro trains use the same tracks. Ah, here is a friendly Amtrak train. the metro train. And occasionally we have freight trains on the same tracks. They all pass a small dead-end spur. This is one of several we will encounter as the result of railroad developments. We will head west over Shaw Street and thence into Waterford. Of the 11 mainline at-grade crossings in the area, the most northerly one is at Minor Lane in Waterford. With access to a few residences and industrial businesses, it is one of the 11 being considered for possible safety improvement. About a half mile west of Minor Lane, the tracks pass under Route 213. Before the bridge was built, it is reported that here was the site of the 1895 Waterford Station and the signal tower 110. 
shown here on the track diagram east of Waterford and here on this photograph. According to Leslie Clyde Phillips's 1984 book Stories and Essays, in the 1930s Waterford Station appears to have been a busy place for the transportation point for passengers, accessing Pleasure Beach for example, and also for the US mail service and for freight activities including granite. Maybe locally from Salem. The freight house was near the current John Hendel Oil Company. A spur is still apparent from the northbound track to the rear of the oil company that dealt with coal and propane in the middle to latter part of the last century. One of the most significant destinations of granite from Waterford Station was for the building of the Cathedral of St John the Divine in New York. From Waterford Station the railroad tracks clipped the south end of Gardiner's Wood Road. Oops, we've just missed the new metro train. With an under the bridge glorious views across Jordan Cove. From Pleasure Beach, one can see the nuclear power station at Millstone. The small station was opened here in 1895, though the earliest photograph we have is in 1905. The quarry at Millstone was accessed from a spur track where a signal tower 109 controlled access until the late 1930s. The track is still apparent on this Google Earth picture. The power plant opened in 1970. West of Millstone in Waterford is the town of East Lyme, in which an East Lyme stop was established in 1852. A local train timetable shows a separate East Lyme and Niantic listing but an 1868 double designation indicates the station as East Lyme in the growing village of Niantic. The earliest pictures we have is in 1893. The 1893 map shows the station, the freight house and the 1889 spur. The station burned five years later from sparks from a locomotive a new station was built in 1899 and a map shows a full Y spur to both tracks on the main line. The station survived the 1938 hurricane. The station's former position is currently identified at the bottom of Pennsylvania Avenue. and the spur exists to supply the local lumberyard. Some Amtrak service existed through the 70s until 1981. Shoreline East service began in 1990 but does not stop at Niantic. At the east end of Niantic Bay is the Niantic River. To cross the entrance there are two bridges. Firstly the lifting road bridge, but more interestingly for us, the railroad bridge. This was built in 1907 as a Schertzer rolling through girder bascule design. The height and width restrictions made the bridge unpopular with boat owners. So to provide an expansion of the Shoreline East service to New London with wider clearances for boaters, construction on a new bascule bridge began in 2010 and was opened to rail traffic in September 2012. For a mile westwards from Niantic, the tracks pass through the 1873 community of Crescent Beach.
and Black Point, where by 1884 there were eight daily trains stopping there. After this summer session the depot was sold to bathers and then removed. By 1887 a new and more ornamental station was built in essence as a meeting ground for large religious communities. By 1891 the shoreline had been double tracked and a new railroad station was completed in 1892, shown here in 1908. Again up to eight daily trains stopped here, but likely a victim of the Great Depression, this became a Saturday only flag stop for one eastbound train by 1933. Just west of the South Line boundary is the area marked on an old map as Four Mile River. In here we have the site of South Lyme Station, opened in 1852. A successor was built in 1895, photographed in 1916. A private undercrossing became access to Shaw Acres Road after the Pointer Woods community was developed in 1918. This photo was taken in 1929 and clearly designated the building as containing a post office. This rare view shows the location of Signal Tower 106. The passenger station closed in 1927, though a substantial structure still exists with a functioning post office too. Neither Amtrak nor Shoreline East trains stop here. Soundview in Old Lyme was established in 1903 as a flag station. By 1910 there was a high level station at Cross Lane though no further building. By 1912 Local pressure generated a more substantial facility, again at the level above the road, and the prestige relocation of a signal tower, number 106, the number having been moved from a previous location. As with other local stations, the depression led to the closure for passengers by 1931. However, freight continued throughout the wartime with the 106 tower lasting until 1960. The last westbound stop close to the Connecticut River was established in 1852 in Old Lyme. By 1875, a new station was established, which is shown here. Stations at Black Hall included a station in 1883 and later in 1907 combined with the Lime Station. Signal Tower 105 can be seen in the distance on the right. This was recognised to be close to the Connecticut River and was completed ready for the new bridge in 1907. The Connecticut River Bridge is closing to indicate that we need to look at at grade 6 for the next part of my railroad story.